All right, good morning, church. Good morning, you guys. Y'all ready for the word of God? Amen. Well, uh, before we get into it, thank you, sir. Got to get a little higher there for me. But uh, before we get into it, it's good to be back in Bakersfield. Those are some words I never thought I would say in my entire life. But it's good to be back. I did the math on it. It's been 12 months since I preached here on a Sunday in Bakersfield. That's a long time. I thought I scared you guys off. I thought I made a bad impression or something. I don't know. But 12 months ago, that's pre-John and Jan Oaks. And I will say John and Jan, they're great and awesome and incredible people. You guys are incredibly privileged to have John and Jan Oaks here serving in your church here. Give them a round of applause there. Great leaders, great Christians, and great people. And, and also Josh and Joel. All right? Inspiring that they would come and, and, and work in the campus ministry and get something started here, right, in the college community here in Bakersfield. And, and I know something can happen out here in the college uh, crowd and demographic here. Me and my wife, before we moved to the Antelope Valley, or I, I should say when we got there, we only had four college students in our ministry. You know, now we have 30 college students in our ministry. And, and we've gotten to as much as 35, and, and we sent some out, and Josh was one of them that we sent out up here. And, 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 and bigger than that, our campus ministry has inspired 60 baptisms in the overall church on top of the work that we've been doing in the campus ministry. And so we baptized in the teens, in the marrieds, in the Spanish ministry, right? all these ministries in our church. The campus ministry can change the church. And so please continue to support Josh and Joel as as, as they continue to serve uh, the Lord in the campus ministry here in Bakersfield. But, uh, but 12 months, again, it's a long time I missed you guys. You know, I, uh, thank you. Hopefully, hopefully you, you all missed me. Uh, and, and if you did, I appreciate that. And if you didn't, you should be ashamed of you. I'm just kidding. It's playing. All right, but a quick intro here. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, again, my name is Amir Burton, and, and I'm from the paradise. I didn't say that earlier. The paradise of the Antelope Valley. All right, that's Palmdale and Lancaster there. And, and together with my wife there on the screen, uh, she's sitting there in the back. We lead the, the teeny campus ministries there. And, and uh, we're, we're now a family of three. Uh, we've been a family of three for a year now. Our son, he celebrated his first birthday last month in August. August 4th. And, and there he is in the, in the center. He's the center of attention. And, and he's running everything. And he's loving life. But, uh, but throughout the sermon today, I'm going to prompt you to talk to the person that you're sitting next to or you're sitting around. All right, we're going to get some small talk going in church this morning. Is that okay? All right, and so I'm going I'm to facilitate this. I'm going to tell you to tell your neighbor something. All right, when I tell you to tell your neighbor something, please turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what you're supposed to tell your neighbor. All right, if you don't do that, church is going to get real awkward. Okay, my self-esteem is going to be shattered. I'm going to have a long drive home, and it's going to be all your fault. All right, so let's, let's just participate, all right? And so let's practice this before we get in. All right, tell your neighbor God is good. And tell your neighbor you look good. There you go. Tell your neighbor you got the best seat in the house. Amen. That's the way it's supposed to work, all right? So let's keep this up as we move forward, Amen. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 7. I'm going to start the sermon now. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse number 3. We'll give you some time to get there. You are welcome. All right, 2 Kings chapter 7. I have it there on the screen for you. We're going to start there in verse number 3. It says, now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? And that's some good stuff right there. They said, why stay here until we die? See, this is for everyone in the church that's ready to go to the next level. This is for everyone in the church that senses, hey, there's, there's something more on the inside of me. And I'm not leaving 2019 until I grow some more. Until I level up, ask your neighbor, why stay here? The title of the lesson this morning is It's Time to Move. Next slide there, it's time to move. Tell your neighbor it's time to move. 
Say it again. Say it's time to move. The brother said it in the welcome. We can't stay stagnant. We can't stay stuck. We got to move forward. We got to move forward in our faith. We got to move forward in our life. We got to move forward in our character. We got to move forward in all of the above. Church, it's time to make a move. We got to make some moves, and this is what we see going on in this morning's text. Again, in verse 3, next slide there, verse 3 says, we'll read it again. They, the four lepers, they said to each other, why stay here until we die? And, and the thing about this verse that I love so much, number one, the Bible says that, that they're at the entrance of the city gate, and, and I don't have time to talk about everything that the scripture is talking about this morning, but, but every scripture, every part, and every word is, is so chock full because God's word is alive. The word is alive. It's the only book you'll read that speaks back to you when you read it. Right? You can read every book on Oprah Winfrey's book club list every day of your life. Right, but when you read that Bible, you feel refreshed. You feel revived. You feel renewed. Tell your neighbor, get in the book. What are you doing? The Bible, the Bible is not an obligation only, it's an advantage. It's not a burden, it's leverage. It's gonna get you ahead. And, and the four men they said, Hey, why stay here until we die? And the Bible tells us that they spoke one to another. Right, so they're talking to each other and they're saying the same thing to each other. And so that means that the whole group had the same mind. And that's a good thing. That's big because we got to make sure our crew, we got to make sure the people in our lives, right, not only speak the same as us, but think the same as us. Why? Because you will wreck your future connecting with the wrong crowd. It's not even you. Wouldn't that make you so, up? it's like Jonah. You guys remember Jonah from the Bible? The story of Jonah? Yeah. Right in the story, Jonah, Sean said no. All right. <laughs> Jonah is running from God. Right, Jonah is running from God and there's this tsunami on this man's boat. And so amongst other things, the boat represents your life. And the people on the boat represent the people that are coming into your life. And so what if you are letting people in your life that are causing storms and causing chaos? See, I don't know about you, but, but I know I can do bad all by myself. I know how to mess up my life. I know how to make my life go wrong. I'm notorious with those, so I don't need anybody else coming in my life to mess things up for me. I don't need any storms on my boat in my life on my job, in my heart, and in my emotions. And so in the story, what did the man tell Jonah? They say, hey, Jonah, you know, hey, we love you, but, but you got to go. You got to get out of here. Tell your neighbor you got, I'm just kidding. Don't tell your neighbor you got to go. Tell your neighbor, I need you, neighbor. You need the people with you, right? And, and in the story, Jonah, he paid money to get on the boat. So he invested in his spot on the boat. And us today, we have people in our lives who've invested in their place in our hearts. What do they say? I was there for you when you had nothing. I gave you money when you were struggling. See, it, it, it doesn't matter. Just because they invested does not mean that they will always deserve a place in your life and in your heart. Just because they invested and they were there when you were at your lowest. Right? Maybe they gave you money. Maybe they let you stay at their place for a little while. It doesn't matter if they become toxic to you. And if they become a distraction from the things of God, you, like the man, have to treat these people in your life like he did Jonah. And you got to get them out of your life. Is that right or is that wrong? And see, I'm saying this because some of us were sinking in the name of of loyalty. We're sinking spiritually, emotionally, mentally, all in the name of loyalty, staying loyal to people that, that aren't even being loyal to the heart that we're trying to have. In church, my encouragement for you this morning is, is don't let the sentimental you sabotage the next you. The biggest setback to the better man or woman of God that you have the potential to become occurs when you allow your feelings 
when you allow your emotions to interfere with cutting people out of your life that do not need to be in your life. And, and, and I don't know who this is for this morning. Well, I know a lot of us parents, right, got a hand being rose in the back, but a lot of us parents, we're trying to get our kids to understand this. And there's people you hang out with, there's people you do not hang out with. Right? And, and this is for sure, it's for, for the children of the parents represented in this room, but no one in this room is above spending time in the company of the wrong crowd. And so we have to recognize when someone was great for us in the past, but not so great for us moving forward. And just because someone has a face, and just because someone has a tone, and, and just because someone has counsel that you are familiar with, does not mean that they'll always be good for you. And we try to talk ourselves out of this, don't we? Me and so-and-so, we've been friends for X amount of years. We've been together for a long time. Me and so-and-so, we always have fun and a good time when we're together. So-and-so knows I'm trying to get my life right with God. Sure, so-and-so may know those things, and sure, so-and-so may be some of those things, but so-and-so may also be some bad company. And last time I checked, the Bible says, and it still says, bad company corrupts what? That's in the NIV, that's the KJV, that's any V of the Bible that you're going to read. It's not going to change. It's called discernment, church. And we got to recognize and we got to get past allowing our emotions to interfere with the assembly of our networks. Tell your neighbor, move on. Move on. on. We're going to move on here. Verse 4, look back at it with me. Verse 4 here. Next slide, if you guys could just help me out with the slides there. Next slide, verse 4 says, so they started off, why sit here until we die? And then verse 4 says, if we say we will go back to our home city, the famine is there, and we will die. So in other words, if we go back to our past, if we go back to what we left behind, if we go back to our former ways, they said, we're surely going to die. And so let me encourage you, people of God. Next slide here. The past is not an option. There ain't nothing in your past, but that's the first temptation. That's the first temptation. As soon as we start trusting in God, as soon as we step out there in faith, if God does not come through on our time frame, if God doesn't come through when we want him to come through, our first temptation is, man, I'm going back to the things that I said I was never going to do Again, we're all prone to this. When God doesn't come through with what we want, when we want, and how we want it, our first temptation is to go back to the former ways. And we forget that the past never worked out for us in the first place. That's why we left it in the past and didn't bring it with us. And this isn't anything new. This isn't just 2019. We see this with the children of Israel. Right? Exodus chapter 3. God says, hey, come out of there. Come out of bondage. Come out of slavery. Come out of Egypt. I'm going to give you a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. And the people said, let's go. They came out there partying, having a good time, walking to the promised land. They said, I'm going to praise God till I can't praise no more. I'm going to eat till I can't eat no more. I'm going to sleep till I can't sleep no more. 20 years passed. I'm going to praise God till I can't praise God no more. I'm going to eat till I can't eat no more. I'm going to sleep till I can't 30 years pass. I'm going to praise God till I can't praise (laughs) God no more. I'm 40 years pass. And what did the people say? They said, we wish to God we were back in Egypt. We wish to God we were back in the past. We wish to God we were back in bondage. They said, where is the promised land? 40 years of this, God, where are you? They said, I've done what I was supposed to do. I've trusted God how I was supposed to trust God. What do we say today? I gave my contribution, right? I'm serving God. I'm being faithful to God. We say the same thing today. Where is the promise? Where is the answered prayer in my life? The people said being a slave is better than the patience of anticipating the blessing of God. 
Just for you. Just for you. They said being a slave is better than the anticipation of patiently waiting for God. And we say the same thing today. I wish I was back in that dysfunctional relationship. I know God does not want me there. And I know I said I would never go back, but being with this person and being with these friends is better than being a lonely Christian. And I wish I was back in in that former sin. Even though I know that God has called me out of that, it's going to fill a void in my life that God has taken too long to fill himself. And so I'm going back. We we go through times where we would rather, like these children of Israel, be enslaved than patiently waiting on the promise of God. And, And I get it. I'm not condemning you. I'm connecting with you. Sometimes waiting on God gets long. It gets long. Sometimes it's like, God, do you, do you hear me? I've been praying this prayer. Are you going to answer this thing or not? Are you there? Are you, have you heard me or not? And, and when you have to wait on God, your first temptation, write it down. It's, it's always to go back. In church, we got to understand that waiting on God is better than any form of bondage that we've ever been called out of. And so next slide here, don't reason with your former while you wait on your future. They said, the men in this scripture, the four lepers, they said, hey, if we go back to our former city, if we go back to the past, what we left behind, there's a famine there. Famine means emptiness. It's barren, no fruitfulness. So there's nothing in there and there's nothing in our past. Tell your neighbor, forget about it. The virtue is called patience, church. And a lot of times we have to step through patience to get to the promise. Because some of the greatest gifts that God will ever give you are on the other side of your patience. It's on the other side of considering giving up. It's on the other side of considering going back. It's on the other side of this is not how I expected things to look like. We have to remember What the Bible says happens and occurs when we allow patience to complete its perfect work. The Bible says we'll be mature, we'll be complete, and we won't be lacking in any of the areas that we have need. And so, church, my encouragement this morning is for you to watch out for the I want it now mindset. The I want it now place, that's a dangerous place for believers to find themselves in. Because a lot of times the life that comes after, when you rush to get things into your life, the life you have to live after that, a lot of times is not pretty. And so we got to get past rushing things in our lives. And we got to get to patience. Amen? Amen. Next slide here back in the the scripture. So they say if we go back, we die. Then they say later on in verse 4, if we stay here, we will also die. Right, so they came out of their former city, they came out of the past, what was behind them, they got to this position, they said, hey, we got to keep moving, because if we stay where we are now, we're, we're going to die. They understood that, that they had to go into new land. They had to go into a new scenario, and so it's not just about coming out of something. It's about going into something else. And how does this, does this, does this relate to us? This is Repentance. And a lot of us, we understand repentance is more than just stopping something, just ending something, right? It's more than that. Jesus didn't die for us just to stop sinning. That's not the point of of, of the cross. That's not the point of faith. That's not the point of Christendom, right? There's more to it than that. And and I can't understand that that a lot of Christians today, they, they limit the life that Jesus called us to just to two Words. Next slide, the two words are don't sin. Don't sin. And so now my entire Christian existence is don't cuss, don't steal, don't lie. And we look like this instead of looking like this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do drugs. Don't sleep around. Don't these other things. 
that's not what the life that God has called us to live. That's not everything involved in the Christian existence. Sure, that's a part of it. I don't want you to hear me wrong. We got to we, we gotta stay away from sin. But we got to move past that into the things that God has called us to pursue. Living this life, this Christian life, just by not sinning, that doesn't create a relationship with God. And that doesn't lead you to love him more. You know, and growing up for me in, in some of the churches that I went to as a, as a kid, my, my whole Christian life, it's centered around sin. Every, my focus was sin. My focus was don't sin because that's all my pastor preached about. And so as a kid, I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, I understand who I can't be anymore. That's all who you ever tell me not to be. But when are you going to give me someone to become? As a kid, as a, as a seven-year-old kid, I'm like, can we talk about the righteousness of God? Can we talk about how much I'm loved in spite of? And this is what we got to do with each other here in this room. We can't just tell each other to stop doing things. We, that's important, but we also have to make sure we're giving each other someone to become and something to become. Because I'm sure many of us in this room, we get who we cannot be. We got to understand and we got to get up to speed to who God has called us to become. Amen. And Amazon taught me something related to this. You guys know Amazon? <laughs> Amazon.com. Y'all know Amazon. .com? You know, I ordered some textbooks from Amazon.com in my undergrad studies. All right, at Cal State University, Long Beach. We got any 49ers in the room in the house? All right, there we go. Got a couple. All right. And, uh, and the tracking number, you know how they always give you that tracking number, right? And, and if you're like me, you stay on that tracking number. Find out when your stuff is coming. All right? They gave me the tracking number, and I was tracking it. And, and the tracking number said that it came on a day that it never showed up on. And so my textbook never came to the house. And, you know, I'm, I, a lot of other students would make that excuse, hey, I didn't get the textbook, I can't do my work and things like that. That wasn't me. Bro, I wanted that high GPA. So what I got on the phone, I called Amazon. I said, hey, this Amazon? They said, yeah. I said, hey, where are my textbooks at? And the guy got on the computer. The, it says that the textbook has been delivered. I said, Amazon. Earth to Amazon. I would not be on the phone with you if I received my textbook. And believe me, I'm not trying to get over on you for a textbook that cost me $200, but as a textbook buyback of $2. I'm not trying to make $2 off this. Okay, I just need my textbook. So I, and in that moment, I got a revelation. Like, oh my goodness. The point is, the next slide, deliverance is not leaving a place. It's showing up somewhere else. Just because the textbook left Amazon did not mean it was delivered. It's not considered delivered until it reaches another destination. Likewise, the same is true with us. You're not delivered when you come out of something. You're delivered when you show up somewhere else. And so the question we all got to ask ourselves today is, what have we started since we came to God. Sure, you stopped the greed, but have you started serving? Sure, you stopped the gossip, but have you started praising God? The question is, what have I started? What have I gone into since I've been saved? Tell your neighbor, it's time to move. Back in the scripture here. Church small talk. Let's participate. All right, 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 4 now. It's recapping. And so actually at the end here of verse 4, it says, So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we die. At dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horse, uh, horses and a, and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. And so they got up and they fled in the dusk and they abandoned their tents and they abandoned their horses and they abandoned their donkeys. Right? And they left the camp as it was and they ran for their lives. And the men who had 
leprosy, they reached the edge of the camp. They entered one of the tents and they ate and drank. Then they took silver, they took gold and clothes, and, and they went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them as well. And so here in the story, we have these four leprous, feeble men, right? They're walking towards their enemies in hopes that they will at best be slaves and at worst lose their lives. And so they're walking feebly, they're walking fearfully, but they're walking faithfully, right? They're still going in spite of how they feel. And the Bible says that, that God caused the enemies to hear this noise, this sound of chariots and, and the sound of, of this great host of, of armies and, and, and coming against them. And the Bible tells us that, that they ran off. And so by the time that the lepers got there, all they saw was the spoil, right? It says they ate and drank. There was food there. There was water there and there, there was treasure there. And so they feebly went. And by the time they got there, the thing that they feared most wasn't even there. And so what's the point here? The point is your prep work clears the path for God to work. God cleared out the camp and the four men walked into the blessing. The four men walked into rewards. And so in other words, the Bible is saying if you make the move, God is going to make the way. If you apply for the job, God's going to get you the interview. Right? If you just say the prayer, God is going to answer the prayer for frail Lepers conquered an army. Why? Because they just walked by faith. If you, they did their part. They said, we can't stay here. We got to move on. If you do your part, God is going to do his part. If you show up for God, God is going to show up for you. But let me say this, your part has got to be more than this last minute, last resort prayer routine. We're good at that, aren't we? Last minute, before we want something in our lives, we pray these last minute prayers that, that we weren't praying days ago. We weren't praying those things weeks ago, months ago. But now all of a sudden we, we want to pray these prayers and we're good at that. But God, oftentimes he's looking at the lifestyle that comes before that prayer. And that's what we got to be aware of. These lepers, right, and this is what we see with them, they were in good company. That's a good lifestyle decision. Right? They, they rejected going back. That's a good lifestyle decision. Right? And they went forward by faith. Another good lifestyle decision. Then God showed up and cleared their enemies and cleared the armies. And so your experience of God's power depends on the depth of discipline you maintain in your life. And talking about this prayer thing, next slide, prayer releases the power of God when you submit to his priorities. And now I'm not saying this is always the case. Or you can't put God in a box. Right? God works oftentimes and a lot of times in unusual ways and in unorthodox ways. But as the people of God, it's wrong for us to expect God to work miracles in our lives if we're not pursuing the value system of the Bible. Is that right or is that wrong? I mean, Jesus in the Gospels, he couldn't do any miracle in his hometown. Why? Because the people living there did nothing to strengthen their belief prior to his arrival. What does that tell us? That tells us we will always sell ourselves short of the power of God if we don't do our part. If we don't do what we have to do, spend time in his word, build relationships within the body, live transparent, open and vulnerable lives. You like these lepers, you will walk into blessing. You will walk into everything that you need in this life if you do your part. Tell your neighbor, don't skip your part. Do your part. All right, that was just for me to say. Some of y'all said it as well, but that's okay. Get in the hang of it. Let's close this thing out. All right, verse 9 now. Recap. And so the man said, hey, we can't go back. Check, they didn't go back. Right, they said, we can't stay here. Check, they didn't stay where they were. They said, hey, let's move forward. Check that off. They move forward, and, and let's see what they do next. Here in verse 9, it says, Then they said to each other, what we are doing is not right. Initially, they had in mind to hide everything that they found in the campsite. They said, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and, 
and we're keeping it to ourselves, if we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. They were in touch with their sin. So they say, hey, let's change this up. Let's go at once and let's report this to the royal palace. They said, this is not good for us to keep all this to ourselves. They said, we got to go back and we got to tell the royal palace. That's our hurting city. Remember, there's a famine there. They said, we got to go back and we got to tell them that that we found bread and and water and resource and treasure that's going to get you through this famine. They said, we got to go back and tell our hometown, even though we were kicked out because we had a disease. If you know anything about leprosy, you know it's a heinous disease. It's destructive, and and people with it, they got banned and kicked out of their homes. And so here you have these four men upon seeing this treasure and this resource. They became concerned about the well-being of the people that kicked them out. And so what do we see here? They express the heart of, next slide, my love for you goes beyond your treatment of me. It doesn't matter how they treated me. It doesn't matter how they treat. And it was a collective agreement. It doesn't matter. We love them in spite of the fact. That's the same heart Jesus demonstrated for us on the cross. I love them beyond this treatment beyond this torture. Even though these men, even though they kicked us out, we're going to go and we're going to help them out. And this is the heart that God blesses. See, not everyone gets this blessing and this reward and this rich treasure in their lives because not everybody has this heart. The heart of, I'm going to do unto others as I would have them. Not make them do unto me, but have them do unto me. This is the kind of people that just walk in the blessing. And it's illustrated here in this passage. And and as we close, the thing that strikes me about these four men here is that nobody visited them. You're not going to read that a prophet came and told them what to do. An angel didn't show up to tell them and direct them on what they should do to give them guidance. You know, they're not as privileged as, as us in this room. You guys have the Bakersfield Church to help offer direction through the word of God. They didn't have the Bakersfield Church. All they had was their initiative. And they took initiative, and they moved forward, and they were blessed. And in church, if we want to move forward in our lives, if we want to experience this reward and blessing in our lives before the end of 2019, like these men here, we have to take initiative. I encourage you to write that word down if you're taking notes. We got to take initiative. And some of us, we got to move our networks around. We got to move our people groups around. And if we don't have to move our people groups around, some of us, we need to bring other people that are actually going to help us into our lives and influence us in a positive way. And some of us, we got to move past our former ways. Some of us, we've been falling into this cycle of of the things that we said that we weren't going to do and, and the things that we said we, we knew we can't do anymore. And so some of us, we got to move past what's in the back. And, and some of us, we got to move and, and we got to do our part. Some of us, we, we keep asking God to do his part before we even settle down and do ours. And lastly, we have to move forward with a do unto others type of heart. And if we do these things in increasing measure, we'll be blessed in an amazing and incredible way. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Thank you. That's the lesson.